Hey, what's up, my people? John Middlecoff, new YouTube channel. What I need you to do, subscribe, like the video, leave a comment, share with your friends. Appreciate everyone that has. It's the podcast, three and out. You can listen wherever you listen to podcasts. Apple, Spotify, we got you covered. Also, thevolume.com, thevolume.com. We got merch right here, flex fit hat. Go to thevolume.com, get yourself a three and out hat. Okay, a lot going on in the football world. A uh, story I missed that I happened about a day ago was RG3 and some of the comments he had on Caleb Williams should pull an Eli Manning uh, and, and refuse to go to the Bears. So wanted to dive into that. Uh, I, I saw a uh, stat today in terms of quarterbacks drafted in t- the 21 and 22 draft, which was pretty eye-opening. But really, once you take a step back, not that shocking. And then I just wanted to dive into some stuff. The Jets signing older players left and right. Netflix is doing a wide receiver show. And uh, a couple other guys that signed contracts that I, I haven't had a chance to hit. Some some bigger name guys that for a decent amount of money. Uh, so obviously, a lot still going on in the football world. Some of these like second, third wave signings. Uh, sometimes are more famous guys that are at a point in time in their career you know, the, the money really matters in terms of the team and them getting on the same page. They're not going to get these astronomical deals. And uh, we'll see that slowly materialize. I mean, I, I think over the next couple of weeks, guys continue to sign here slowly, but surely. But I don't even know where oh, my cell phone's charging. I, I was going to grab my smartphone because that is where you download a little app. And that app is called Game Time the official ticketing app of this podcast. Uh, I, I'm sure you'll see the NCAA tournament going on these next couple of days, the quote-unquote play-in game, uh, which I'm not opposed to. It just adds a little more drama to the tournament. And here's what I would do. If you want to go to one of these games this Thursday, this Friday, this weekend, if it's coming to your area, just download the Game Time app and use the promo code JOHN, J-O-H-N, J-O-H-N, and save $20. Very, very easy to do. Promo code John, $20. Concerts, comedy shows, any college or pro event as well. Just use the promo code John. Save yourself $20. Don't even need a thank you. Just hammer that promo code. John. Robert Griffin III, who has a podcast, I guess, and had some comments that... I saw, I think, like, SportsCenter kind of cut it up and and retweeted it. It was kind of going viral over the last 24 hours. Basically said that Caleb Williams should pull an Eli Manning and refuse to go to the Bears, essentially because of the way that they treated Justin Fields. Now, before we dive into why this is a dumb take, all of our opinions our biases based on our experiences. Every single one of us, especially the older we get, are based on things from our past, right? Listen, I, I, I talk, I would say, pretty negatively about Chip Kelly. I was with the Eagles when he took over, and I got fired. You could say I have a bias there, and I, I would say that's fair. Now, I believe he's pretty fraudulent, not that good, and treats... Pr- people pretty poorly because I have firsthand experience of seeing it and seeing my friends that had to deal with them uh, in their experiences. Now you can say I'm wrong, uh, but I would say my firsthand experience lends me to have, you know, a very educated opinion when I state something about the guy. And I think part of my role in doing what I'm doing is I can talk about the sport from a unique perspective that you're not going to hear anywhere else because of my experiences and because of the people that I continue to talk to in the league. Yet I'm not a reporter and I'm not trying to go back in the NFL and I simply don't give a shit. So I'll just say whatever and bring it to you pretty unfiltered where RG three, like his experience in Washington changed his life, right? He thinks he got screwed, whether that's the Shanahan's refused to help him out as his career went, whether it was whether they threw him out too quickly off an injury and derailed his entire career, whether it's just simply that those guys didn't want him. Like, that's not an opinion. That's a fact. Mike Shanahan and Kyle Shanahan did not ever want RG3. 
They did not want to make the trade. They did not want to draft him. The owner forced their hand. That's why they drafted Kirk Cousins, who clearly they liked a lot more. So if you're sitting in RG3's shoes, you go going to a place that is the wrong spot to land can ruin your entire career. Because, listen, I'm not the biggest RG3 guy uh, at all right now. <clears throat> I will not dispute in his younger years before he got injured an explosive prospect. Had a pretty high ceiling. Would he ever been Lamar Jackson? I don't believe so. But he, he definitely would have had a very, very productive career that clearly didn't happen. And a couple years later, he's benched for Kirk Cousins, and the rest is history. And he's still bitching and moaning about it. Kirk Cousins, meanwhile, is making $450 million, kicking ass, taking names in terms of the bank account, and still playing, coming off a torn Achilles. Team lined up to get him for $100 million. So I understand if I put myself in RG3 shoes, his bitterness and his perspective on this, even if I disagree. Because one, like, I'm sorry, Kyle Shanahan kind of proven he knows what he's doing, especially when it comes to a quarterback. And he might say, well, look, he ruined Trey Lance's career. And I'd say Trey Lance never could play. Should never have picked him that high. Look what he did with Jimmy Garoppolo. <laughs> Look what the Raiders tried to do with Jimmy Garoppolo. It's, it's pretty difficult to play with a quarterback who's not any good. But that's beside the point. RG3's comments about, let's start with this. Did Justin Fields not get a fair shot? I'm calling bullshit. Early on in his career, like a lot of young quarterbacks who go to bad teams, there's not much talent around him. So it is a difficult proposition. Yet this last season, when they traded for DJ Moore, Cole Komet was becoming a very solid tight end. They drafted good offensive linemen. They had Mooney. There was more than enough to show that you were worth keeping around. And he didn't do it. That does not mean his career is going to be a disaster. That does not mean he can't resurrect his career. But this year when they had the opportunity because of a great trade to have the number one overall pick, he didn't even come remotely close to showing enough with enough talent to at least show that. He didn't. Here's the other thing. Like when RG3's case, when someone doesn't want you, doesn't believe in you, and this is even different because ultimately Mike Shanahan was the head coach when RG3 was drafted, Ryan Poles didn't draft Justin Fields. Welcome to the real world. If you work for any company and the guy that hired you leaves, gets fired, moves on to another job, and someone else comes in, your job is in jeopardy. No business quite like football when new management comes in, either a new GM or a new head coach, are players' positions in question. Keenan Allen is one of the greatest players in the history of the Chargers. Just had a season where he had 110 catches in like 11 games. Jim Harbaugh comes in, trades him. Welcome to the National Football League. Justin Fields not only didn't get screwed, he honestly got the opportunity to go start for the Steelers. He was never going to start for the Bears. Even if they kept him around and they drafted Caleb Williams, he's never beaten that guy out. It's just not happening. So that is its own conversation. Fields did not get screwed. And I see that a lot on social media. They did him a disservice. Bullshit. <laughs> he had the opportunity, like most players in the NFL and most people in life, you either run with it, and literally he tried, or you come up a little short. And luckily, when you have a lot of talent, like Fields has, he's going to get other opportunities. Now, Caleb Williams should hold out and pull an Eli. That, to me, is insane. Because, as and I've stated to this the last, I think, 20 years just thinking about it. I think this is easily. Honestly, there might be a large gap between the second team. The best opportunity for if number one overall pick in terms of a roster he gets to inherit as a quarterback. Typically, these number one overall drafting teams fucking suck. They have nothing going for them. They don't have talent on offense, and they definitely are awful on defense. It's one thing when you lack people on offense. When your defense is awful, you have no chance because you're always playing from behind. So you're always in pass-first situations because you're down in the game with bad offensive lines, limited skill guys, and you're not able to run the ball, which can be a young quarterback's best friend. So you're at a huge disadvantage. You're playing 
you basically with your hands tied behind your back. Look, look at Bryce Young this year. Even if, uh, regardless of what we think about him sitting here right now, you, I think it's fair to say like he was at a very, very difficult position. It wasn't exactly advantageous to have some star year. Caleb Williams gets to inherit DJ Moore and Keenan Allen. Number one drafting teams never have that on their team. He also gets a tight end, some young offensive linemen. Here's the other thing. His team, this isn't their only pick. They didn't have the number one overall pick. They won seven games. They have the ninth pick, meaning they have draft capital, meaning they might draft some other sweet player that can help this guy. Now, the one thing that is fair to question is they have a coach who I read today that when they traded fields, uh, Eberflus called some of the you know team leaders on the team that were close to fields. One of them was Cole Komet. Cole Komet's quote was, I was getting ready to hit the town in Chicago, go out with some buddies and have a good night. And I got the phone call from the head coach and it kind of rocked me, even if I knew it was kind of inevitable and I ended up not going out. I just kind of stayed in, drank my sorrows away. But my takeaway from that was, listen, is Eberflus a good head coach or not? We're about to find out. Pretty high-level guy. Clearly a pretty solid defensive coordinator. And just a good person. So you're not going... Historically, some of these teams were such jokes because economically, they had limited ability to be flexible. One of the problems in the latter years of Al Davis was his team didn't have any money. So it was very difficult for them to operate. It's why these high draft picks would hold out. Greg Papa told me these stories forever. He did not have the cash to give them the signing bonuses. That was, you know, less than 20 years ago. And he was not alone. A lot of these teams that didn't have these multi-billionaire owners were somewhat, you know, at a disadvantage because they didn't have the cash. And as these salaries were rising at just quick rates, well, nowadays, everyone is flush with cash whether you're Mike Brown or whether you're Jerry Jones or David Tepper. Everyone is swimming in money. So the world's changed. You could be like, yeah, the Bears owner, kind of old, a little out of it. Who cares? The franchise has cash. They have a general manager that clearly sees, you know, knows what he's doing. And if Eberflus can't get it done, they will be a very, very highly desired landing spot for a coach next offseason. So this notion that he should pull an Eli Manning is not only laughable, it would be bad business for Caleb. Like this is a spot situated to go have success. Honestly, you could have a year where we're talking like, holy shit, we got CJ Stroud last year and now we got Caleb Williams. They have that much talent on the roster. And they they potentially have a really good defense. Maybe not like the 85 Bears, but how many rookie quarterbacks Get to go to a team with a top 12-ish defense. Never happens. If you suck in the NFL, it's rare that just your offense sucks. Typically, your defense is a joke. That's just not the case here. The thrill and excitement of March Mania is here. And DraftKings Sportsbook, one of America's top-rated sportsbook apps, is giving new customers a shot to turn 5 bucks into $150 instantly in bonus bets with any college basketball bet. North Carolina listeners, don't forget DraftKings Sportsbook is now live in your state. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code JOHN, J-O-H-N. New customers can bet five bucks to get $150 instantly in bonus bets only at DraftKings Sportsbook with code JOHN. The crown is yours. And obviously this is, you know, I do the draft daily every week. This is all kind of tied into that. Sometimes it'll just naturally happen in the show. There was, I saw this thing floating around on the internet that in 2021, which was the Lawrence, Zach Wilson, Trey Lance, Justin Fields, Mac Jones draft. Then the following year, which was, you know, Kenny Pickett and some other dudes, 19 quarterbacks were picked. Over a two-year span, 19 quarterbacks were drafted. As of today, Going into this season, week one, only two of them are scheduled to be starters. Trevor Lawrence, who, a lot like Caleb Williams, was viewed as the number one pick when he was like 18 years old. 
and Brock Purdy. That's that's a pretty insane stat. Even if that 2020 fall season, when it comes to college football, is one of the great Fugazis of all time, right? I mean, the schedules were all over the place. Half the teams only played league games. BYU schedule was a joke. Trey Lance's team didn't even play a season. Uh, Justin Fields had to beg Kevin Warren uh, to, to play because he wanted to cancel everything. Him, Jim Harbaugh, and Ryan Day were like, fuck out of here, you moron. We're playing football. Uh, that that one didn't age as well. But you know now, ironically, Kevin Warren is, is running the Bears. But the Big Ten and the Pac-12 really, really had to fight to play where the SEC is like, we're playing. <laughs> we're rocking and rolling. And that's obviously, depending on where you live, things operated a lot differently in 2020. Hell, I remember in the Bay Area, it, it was insanity in the summer, and I came to Arizona on a, on a golf trip, and it was like completely normal. This was in the summer of 2020. It's like I already was on the fence about moving before 2020 even came about. I'm like, I'm going there, and uh, don't regret it. But I, I think it brings to light that a couple things. I don't care how talented the player is. I don't care how big of a can't miss the guy is. This shit is really hard. It is very, very difficult. It's hard to play professional sports no matter who you are, no matter what sport, no no matter what position. Whether you're a goalie in hockey, whether you're a reliever in baseball, whether you, you know, a sharpshooter in basketball or a punter or a kicker in the NFL. It is difficult. And at quarterback, where by far, you have the most amount of pressure. Talk to the media three times a week. You basically are in charge of relaying what the coach is telling you to your other teammates and then running the play. Knowing absolutely where all other 10 guys are doing and what the defense is doing, anticipating what they're going to do, and then when they do that or do something different, adapting on the fly. And like I've always said, the most underrated attribute of a quarterback isn't size, isn't arm strength, isn't accuracy, it's toughness. Because ultimately, you're going to get fucking hit. And you're going to get slammed to the ground by guys that run four eight forties that are 310 pounds. They're all they're littered all over the league right now. They're, it's impossible to quantify that. It, it, it really is. So drafting always has been and always will be very, very difficult in general, let alone at the quarterback position. There is no such thing as like, this guy has a high floor. Bullshit. Mac Jones had a really high floor. No, he does not. Every player is the same. They're either going to maximize all their talent or they're probably going to be average or suck. There's not like this middle ground usually, when you, especially when you draft guys high. It's why Mac Jones, another team. Trey Lance, another team. Justin Fields, another team. Zach Wilson, they can't even trade him. He is not a tradable player. Because I, I haven't looked at his exact salary. If I had to guess, it's eight, nine million dollars this year. No one, if he was a free agent, would give Zach Wilson a one year, eight million dollar contract. Honestly, his his market would be like one year, one million, it'd be veteran minimum contract. So no one's trading for that. I, I would guess the Jets are gonna have to cut Zach Wilson. Kenny Pickett, the following year, was basically just Mac Jones reincarnated, who could run a little faster. But the other thing that is at the forefront of this league, because of the money, because of the society we live in, there is no patience anymore. No one's giving you four years to figure it out. We don't got time. I was thinking about this. I was watching the Warrior-Knicks game. Jalen Brunson, God, that guy's a badass. Looks like a little NFL running back. Guys like Christian McCaffrey or Saquon Barkley. He was just working the Warriors. I'm like, this game, this game sucks. The Knicks are kicking the Warriors' ass. I'm not watching this. So I went in the other room and I watched Love is Blind, which I, I don't pretend to. I, I I watched the first season a long time ago and I'm watching this. It's the most absurd show I've ever seen in my life. To say I love you to someone that you can't see and are talking through a wall, let alone get married to that person, is... Now, this all could be fake. It probably is. But if there is any truth in reality to this show, it's the craziest thing I've ever seen on television from human beings. And maybe it's just the cameras are on. They're trying to, you know, become quote unquote stars or Instagram famous or something. But if they're actually meaning the things that they're saying to each other without ever meeting each other, I mean, getting married to someone you've never seen 
is the crazy and i'm like on episode two and these two get he gets engaged it felt like after like two days they're kissing and loving it's like this, this thing has no chance to succeed these people will be divorced in less than a month but it's very entertaining though i'm not, not I, i'm not too cool to admit that i was pretty entertained just because it was so absurd it, it was so over the top and I almost want to believe that these people actually believe it. And listen, there's enough crazy people in the world now that I, I think there probably is some sincerity in some of the things they're saying. But we none of us have time anymore. And time is always, you know, and has been forever, the most valuable asset we'll ever have. And the older you get, you realize that. You start realizing, God, I'm almost 40. How much life do I have left? Like, what you just, how much money is worth to you? Like, no, my time's worth more. Doing things you want to do are the most valuable thing you'll ever have, whether that's with your family, whether that's with your children, whether that's with your own company, what, whatever, whether that's at your job. But like the time, what you allocate, the older you get, it's not, you don't get infinite, infinite amount of it. And these teams and these coaches, there is so much money on the line. Th these jobs are so important to have because of what they pay in their profession. Obviously there are only 32 head coaches, 32 GMs. They're just not waiting. And it has been on the forefront these last couple of years of like, Kenny Pickett, you're bitching and moaning. See you get the fuck out of here. Trey Lance, you're not even close to good enough. Go to Jerry. Mac Jones, head to Jacksonville with your parents. See ya. I mean, it's just it. Jack Wilson, please someone, we will take uh, some footballs, uh, a 12 pack of Gatorade zeros and some chicken wraps. And we will pay for his flight to you guys, please. And people are like, Nope, we're good. We, we want our chicken wraps and our Gatorade zeros. I mean, that's where we're at. So we're just, which I enjoy. Uh, patience is someone else's problem now in the NFL. Like, Hey, maybe you'll figure it out, but we don't have time because we're all going to get fired. Our owner, and forever, and this gets back to the Al Davis, and just I think the league was in the 2000s. It was much more difficult for teams. Think how many owners pre probably 2010, when, when the money really jumped at the new CBA, kept a coach that they wanted to fire because they didn't want to pay him to do nothing. I've been paid to do nothing one time in my life for about three months. It was an incredible feeling. I mean, it really was. I'm not lazy. I I, I would say I, I'm relatively ambitious relative to the rest of society. And and paying to be, do nothing at the time, I was probably 31 years old, making like 85K and just getting those checks of like, I, what if this was $10 million and I was an NFL coach or one of these players that just gets bought out and told to go home? Like that is... Historically, people do not want to do that to anybody. You don't want to pay someone to do nothing. And you, uh, historically, a lot of companies or professional leagues couldn't afford to do that. So you just kept people now. It's like, get this guy out of here. Coach, GM, player. Obviously, players make more than coaches and GMs. But the urgency is ramped up. And I, th I think it reflects the world we live in. Patience. And I'm an impatient person normally. Uh, or and naturally, but I would say what I'm at currently has amped up tenfold just because the way the, the dopamine hits from the phone, uh, if something is boring on television, you got a million other options. Like, wh why do you think Netflix is doing this wide receiver series? Like, they've gone all in on these shows. Why? Clearly, people are watching them. I, I'm not a NASCAR guy at all. I mean, I could list 10 NASCAR racers in the history of the sport. But I was bored probably within the last month. No, what it was is I was flying to Indy and I needed something to watch and I couldn't find a good movie on Netflix. And I found basically the F1 full swing version of NASCAR. I'm like, I'll download a couple for the plane if, if I get bored. And I was glued. And I was like, God, this is pretty entertaining. And I think what a lot of these shows are, F1, what the golf show is. I didn't watch the tennis, but I would imagine that's pretty entertaining. NASCAR, this wide receiver show, what the what the quarterback show was, is it's not diehard people watching. Not that they don't watch. It's the casual person. And now I'm more inclined, like, oh, what's Joey Logano doing? 
how's Denny Hamlin and Michael Jordan doing? And like, I understand, like I watched the golf one. I'm like, yeah, this kind of hit or miss. But if I'm a casual person, some of the stories might grip me. And that's where, like, when I used to get sick in the 90s and stay home from junior high or elementary school, I had five channels. I had ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox, and like the local 31, which was like a lot of local stupid shows. And you only had whatever was on those show or those channels were what you watched when you were stuck at home. It's why most people my age watched The Price is Right. Because that was on at 10 a.m. when you were sick. I didn't have like, unless you had some VHS movie, which back then you had to rent at Blockbuster if you didn't own them. So you were kind of limited to what was on television. Well, now I got a 10 million options. Oh, right, what's on Apple Plus? What's on Paramount? What's on Hulu? What's on the Peacock? I, I think these quarterbacks and coaches think like that with quarterbacks. A million quarterbacks every year coming through. Easy to upgrade. If this guy stinks, we can't keep playing him. And whether he's making seven million on a top ten quarterback contract or whether he's a mid round pick like Sam Howell, get out of here. See ya. We're on to the next one. So all these quarterbacks in this draft, starting with Caleb, because there is no such thing as a can't miss. To Jaden, to May, to JJ, half those guys are not going to be good at all, and half those guys are going to be lose their starting job within a couple years because that's the world we live in. Uh. I feel like the Jets, who I just read right before I hopped on, are signing Mike Williams, former Charger wide receiver, which totally, if I was them, I would do that too. I would say it happened a lot in like the 90s and 2000s. It happens a little less now because professional sports teams are just smarter. It, it I remember it happened like with the, the Rockets when they signed Charles Barkley. They had Akeem. They had like Clyde Drexler. They just got all these big name dudes that were older and hope they could, like, find some magic. It still happens occasionally in the NBA for sure. I mean, shit, the Suns with Kevin Durant and Bradley Beal happens still in the NBA because of big-name guys. In the NFL, a big-name guy usually has to take pay cuts, and he goes, and everyone acknowledges, like, he's probably not as good as he once was. Like, when J.J. Watt left the Houston Texans and went to the Cardinals, it was like, yeah, he's probably going to be nowhere near what he once was in his prime. And he was still actually pretty solid when he was healthy, but we all knew when he was going. Like, Tyron Smith... Still a good player, but no one thinks he's, like, in the peak of his powers. Mike Williams, like, always hurt. We all kind of acknowledge it. But it does feel like the Jets, and I don't blame them, because they can't go all in on hoping, like, young players succeed. Like, they're all in on Aaron Rodgers. So when you trade for Morgan Moses, who I've always sneaky kind of liked, sign Tyron Smith, you sign Mike Williams, Obviously, your offensive line, you can't afford for it to be as shitty as it was last year or you're screwed, but it does feel like a throwback team. Like, this doesn't happen as often in the NFL anymore because teams are always balancing, like, the future and the present. feels like the the Jets are strictly just focused on, like, week one. Like, it's just let's just find a way because if they don't and they're not in the playoffs, like, everyone's getting fired. Like, that's going to happen. And to me, the crazy part is if we just assume their defense will be solid, which it's been up and down a little bit for the hype, but definitely hasn't been ultimately their problem over the last couple of years. The pressure on Nathaniel Hackett and Aaron Rodgers at 40 years old coming off an injury is pretty high. And if I was a Jets fan, I'd rather have obviously Aaron Rodgers even off an Achilles than Zach Wilson. But it's it feels like it could go bad really quick. And I've been hammering this up for a while. Hard to see it going well. I, I think if it goes well, it'd be one of the bigger surprises in the NFL. Because older players get hurt. And they're they're literally signing some guys that are big name guys that have made a lot of money. They get injured a lot. So I, I think the Jets the Jets are like a the ultimate case study of like, yeah, this feels like a team that someone would have put together back in 07. Uh, typically not in 2024. A couple other things that happened. <clears throat> Chase Young signed with the Saints for $13 million. One year fully guaranteed, according to a guy named Adam Schefter, which I, that's a lot for my taste, but totally understand teams being interested in him. He plays a premium position. And then I read today on Pro Football Talk that he needs neck surgery. 
and he will not be available to hopefully early on in training camp. That's crazy. Like, I, I don't think I could sign him if I was a general manager to a guaranteed contract at a number like that until he was healthy and could pass the physical. Now you go, well, hey, other teams were willing to do it. Yeah, I'd let another team take that risk. We've already seen this guy be injured before and be a shell of himself, what he once was as a rookie and definitely what he was as a college player. Now you're getting someone coming off a neck surgery that plays a position where literally you hit your with your neck like every play. I find the risk on this signing extremely high. Now, maybe I'm biased. Maybe I'm down on the guy. I, I think he's pretty overrated. I think he's as stiff as a board. I, I watched him go through the motions in the NFC Championship game. But $13 million for a guy who immediately ne needs neck surgery? I, I just have a hard time sitting in a free agency meeting with the GM, the head coach, the defensive coordinator, the assistant GM, how we come to the conclusion, like, this is worth the risk. <clears throat> Feels like there's way more risk than the upside. Because what's the upside? When's the last time he showed to be like a borderline Pro Bowl level guy? You'd be like, well, we're not quite paying him like that. Well, you're not paying him nothing. It's not like you're paying him $3 million. You're paying him $13 million. The other thing I saw that was pretty nuts, I'm all for trading for disgruntled players or a highly drafted player from another team, especially when you don't have to give up much compensation. So I get the Browns trading for Jerry Judy. You go, listen, situation's been weird. They soured on him. Even if he's a little overrated given his draft's position, we still liked him coming out. We want to get a hold of this guy. Then I saw today, that they gave him a contract extension with $41 million guaranteed. How could you give a player who has been extremely underwhelming a huge contract extension when he's never played a snap for your team? Like, I understand trading for T. Higgins or Brandon Ayuk or Legereus Need. Hey, we'll give you some picks. We give him a big extension. Like, you know, guy's been a really good player. Put him in your system. You feel confident. A.J. Brown happens all the time right, with high-end guys. To trade for this and to extend them, that seems like bad business. That seems a lot like Chase Young. Like, What's the point of this risk? What was he going to do? Hold out? You go, well, what if he has a great season? Then we deal with it then. I don't know. And I think they'll go, well, if he has a good season, this is a discount. Seems like a lot of things have to go well you know, for this all to align. Because if he is just 20% better than he's been, which would be a drastic improvement, he's still not worth this. I don't know. I uh, Sometimes I th see things in the NFL, and, and I understand the cap's gone up, so money, you know, 41 is the old 28. Why would you be in the business of extending players who haven't shown to be high-end, impactful guys that haven't played for you. Like, what don't you want to wait and see, like, oh, how he fits in the culture, how he gets along with our coaches, how him and Deshaun Watson have any chemistry? W wouldn't that be something that you might go, yeah, let's 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 figure this out. We literally just might assign one of the worst contracts in the history of sports. Let's just be easy when it comes to some question marks with players once we trade for them.